I live in a world of magic. What can I say? I just, you know, need I ask? <laughs> this is this is what it's like in my studio. I was like, yeah. every, you know, it's funny. You know, now that Jonathan has kind of popularized the the thought of symbolic thinking, you know, mm -hmm. I thought that I was a symbolic thinker this whole time, you know. Um, but I think that my expression of it, the way that I would word things would probably be different than his. And it, for a while, I felt kind of bad about that. I was like, oh, I must just not have been getting it this whole time. Um, but no, I think uh, where I do uh, intersect there is in terms of patterns of history. So I'm okay. going to be talking about some patterns of history in the talk and also patterns of artistic thinking when we're creating and when we're in that flow like we we can feel like we're touching something of the divine and mm. it's because we totally are uh, and i i think that whether artists are conscious of that or not that is our role mm. you know in the world yeah. it's a prophetic calling you know the work that i do with these novels means that i go into very very difficult parts of history that are very wounding you don't write a book about the Holocaust and not lose a part of yourself. You, part, part of me died with that first book mm. and with Berliners. Welcome back, everybody, to Dialogues with Derek. I'm your host, Derek Fiedler. Joining me today is Vesper Stamper. She's an award-winning illustrator and author. She's the host of the podcast Vesperisms, The Art of Thinking for Yourself which aims to cultivate a rehumanized worldview through artistic thinking. She's also the author of A Cloud of Outrageous Blue and the historical fiction book entitled Berliners. And we're very excited uh, to be meeting down in Florida for the Symbolic World Summit. Vesper is going to be a speaker uh, with Jonathan Bajot, Neil DeGrade, and amongst others. Vesper, thank you for joining. Thank you so much for having me, Derek. I'm excited about it. Where, sh where should we start? Well, I'm just wondering, so you have, it seems like you have a lot of things going on. You have the illustration, you have the writing, you have the podcast, like, how, how do you make it all work in your, oh, your goodness. life? Uh, well, <laughs> uh, do I make it all work? I'm not really sure. Um, <laughs> well, let's start with the illustration. So I've always been an illustrator. That's my primary vocation. Um, I have two degrees in illustration. It's really all I ever wanted to do. I had a couple hiccups, but you know, illustration has been my passion. And uh, I came to writing novels um, about 10 years ago, a little, mm -hmm. little over 10 years ago. And I never thought that I was that person who had anything to say beyond my journals or, you know, my poetry or my songwriting. And uh, it, it really just fell in my lap. Mm -hmm. So now I write and illustrate books of historical fiction. I, the joke is also that I failed English and history in high school. So it's I not just guys, like Pink Floyd. <laughs> it's like God's cosmic joke on me, you know. Yeah. Um, but I found that actually the way that I was encountering um, history and writing was just, you know, my, my own way of making sense of it that wasn't necessarily um, the traditional path. But I found that I, I really love the research. I, um, I'm good at it. I can I say that? Um, I know how to make connections. I understand like historical rhymes and cycles. And it's it's really kind of a wild ride. And I'm here for it. So that's what awesome. I do. Yeah. yeah, I just started getting into Berliners recently. And I was really impressed with the level of detail. I mean, down to the names of the food or the little mannerisms and just curious, like how how did you come up? Was this just like you just deep dive and researched? Uh, did you live in the area? Well, I was born in Germany, but I was born in an army base and I left as a baby. I do have actual, I have memories of it because I'm one of those people that has weird, uh, you know, early memories. Um, but, and, you know, in the sense that I always felt like, yes, that's where I'm from. I'm not really from here. I grew up in New York, but um like the question of where I'm from and, and all of that stuff gets, you know, kind of complicated. Um, but I also grew up in a Jewish home. And so the subject of Germany was very fraught in my house. Like my stepdad, my Jewish stepdad um, would never buy anything German, for example. He wouldn't buy a German car or ger eat German food or anything like that. Um, and so I kind of, you know, always felt like this weird uh, hybrid. 
Mm. And uh, so Germany was always kind of there in my mind. Judaism was always kind of there in my mind. And in grad school, I wrote a book that became my debut novel, which was What the Night Sings, which is about the mm. uh, three years, the three year period right after the Holocaust and what happened to the survivors right after that, because I think we don't we don't often stop to think uh, what what was their process of re-entering the world when they were stateless, had no possessions, uh, you know, had their entire families murdered. And um, how do you rebuild a life such that you become, you know, the, the people whose grandparents I grew up with, you know? So uh, writing that book about the Holocaust was a real deep dive for me in, in terms of um, you know, what are the roots of genocide, but particularly the roots of anti-Semitism and persecution of the Jews, which I discovered through that research is a cyclical phenomenon. It is not uh, what we're seeing today. It just happens to be right at the peak of that 70, 75 year cycle of um, uh, major waves of anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. So um, after writing that book, I naturally, you know, had questions that came out of it, which was, okay, well, now I understand what happened to the survivors right after the war, but then what happened to the perpetrators? Where did they all go? Uh, did, do they have anything to do with the people living in Germany today? And then what is this Berlin Wall that all of a sudden emerged at, as if, you know, from nowhere, you know? Right. So uh, doing doing that research and discovering that actually... Uh, th those two events were quite connected and mm -hmm. the descendants of both of those people, you know, were, th th their lives were much more intertwined than we think. Mm -hmm. um, and so writing Berliners challenged a lot of the assumptions that even I had um, about that time period and about the Cold War generally, but also about human nature and why people make the decisions they do, why, why nations and governments and systems make the moves that they do. Mm. Were there any uh, other influences for that story? I know it's said um, with uh, almost like these quarreling brothers or at least twins that were trying to to grow up in a very uh, divided world at the time. Yeah, so I um, I was starting to learn about the Berlin Wall and the nature of that and everything, and I thought, well, you know, how do I tell this story? And that's kind of always the when I'm starting a new book, it's the challenge of all right, I have this time period that I want to write about and it's um, it's stirring my curiosity but when it comes to telling the story through characters mm -hmm. how do I do that I'm dealing with that at the moment I'm starting a, a sequel to Berliners oh. and uh I was sitting in church and the reading for for that morning happened to be the story of Cain and Abel and all of wow. a sudden everything just clicked and fell into place I thought mm -hmm. oh we are not only you know here's another historical cycle here's another um, the frame that we're living through at the moment in the United States is Cain and Abel. Mm -hmm. And so does that have anything to say to the division of Germany e into East and West? And indeed, mm -hmm. it very much did. Mm. When I was traveling, I came across people that uh, grew up on the East side and he was just describing that life. And it got me really thinking back then, because it was just a very short conversation. Um, and just like man it just felt like for me approaching history was like man the east or like that that whole division was like so far away it's the other side of the world right. it got me imagining what would it be like to be in one city with such a division running through it and so this book is just like oh my goodness like i can explore those imaginations that i had 10 years ago it's it's been yeah. wonderful yeah, it's, I always think of it as, uh, you know, growing up in New York, like, what would it be like if somebody built a wall down Fifth Avenue? Oh, yeah, I think It's about the that. same thing. What would that be like? How would that change the the nature of the city and the flow of it? it, it a city, you know, it's like a living organism. It depends on, on its blood flow and being able to, you know, move around and get through your neighborhood and, and procure the things that you need, the services that you need. And all of that was was disrupted overnight, literally overnight on August 13th, 1961. But then what does that mean for your relationships? And, you know, even in one family and, and what does it do even to yourself? So I kind of have begun to think of uh, 
the situation in Berlin is these fractal divisions. Mm. You know. What do you so mean by that? You, fractal you have divisions. the you have the division of the world into east and west. You have the division of then Germany and then Berlin and then this one family and then these brothers and then the division within themselves that mm. is the thing that we oh. have to face in ourselves as well. Yes. Yes. Reminds me of um, Matthew Peugeot's book, The Language of Creation, how they're talking about this cosmic level of, you know, heaven and earth, but then it zooms in, zooms in, and pretty soon you get to uh, one person and the uh, the center of the person is the human heart. It's a right. place of transformation. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I actually picked up Matthew's book. Um, it's, <laughs> you know, it's one of those books where you, you start it and then you chew on it for about two years. Yes. And then you come back to the next chapter. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so that's yeah. how I'm, I'm making my way through Matthew's book the same way that I'm making my way through the Brothers Karamazov. Although that has been taking me about a dozen years. Uh, and I hope to, I hope to dozen... finish Matthew's book before the conference. That's my goal. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. I think, yeah, actually, yeah. It took me two summers. I was uh, at school at Davis and uh, University of California, Davis and, read it one summer. I was just like, oh man, I, I better get back to school. I, <laughs> I might not show up to class if I keep reading this. Yeah. And then the next summer I came around and, and finished it off. Um, mm -hmm. But I always come, yeah, that both of those books are ones that I come back to regularly, uh, especially like the treatise on love and, you know, the elders and the scenes that, that they're involved with, with the brothers. But Matthew, it's just like, people ask me, how many times have you read it? And it's like, I don't know how to answer that, man. Like I read a couple chapters or I do research and then I like skim it. And it's like, all of a sudden it's like, how, how did I not read that chapter? You know, it's yeah. like suddenly yeah. it has a, a context that fits in just what I needed at the time. Yeah. It, I'm grateful that it is broken into such short chapters so that you yes. can just kind of, you know, integrate one concept of it at a time. And, yeah. and once you've got it, then you can move on. You don't feel like you have to speed read it. So appreciate it. It drove me that. crazy the first time I read that. I was like, it's only three pages and you're starting a new chapter, but yeah. it like forces you to slow down and like really let it sink in. It's like, you truly are learning another language. You can't learn that overnight. True. And, and as a writer, I, you know, pacing is really, it's such an important aspect uh, of a book is how you speed up and slow down the reader's experience. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you yeah. kind of craft w when you want to have them dwell in a space and in a concept for you know, a long time, as opposed to when you want them to feel kind of the adventure of, of the chase, you know? Mm. Mm. So. I felt that reading the first couple of chapters in your book, it felt like the first one left me wanting more, the story of the parents. And it was just like, I don't know how you did it, but it made me feel like I was able to learn a lifetime in just a couple pages. Mm. Um, and then the other ones, it's like, it zooms in. It's like the couple of pages of dialogue of just family interactions around a table. Yeah. It's like, you know, kind yeah. of go from this view down to like just the sentence by sentence view. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. I got to ask what's uh what's happening in the background. You have <laughs> oh. like a swirl of prisms going on or, yes. or something. Uh, I live in a world of magic. What can I say? Oh. I just, you know, <laughs> Need I ask <laughs> this is, this is what it's like in my studio is like, yeah. every, you know, just the inspiration is always floating around. No, I um I have a little mechanical prism in my window that is solar um, controlled. And so it only okay. happens once a day when the sun is perfectly positioned to catch, um, the, to fill up the solar panel. So- um, Is that why we scheduled the interview for this hour of the day? It, it was fortuitous, yeah. yeah. Um, no, I, I hope that the viewers are- or taken on a journey. It's I put it up because I'm working on a book that actually has uh in the text it has um this kind of thing in it. And I thought, oh, I have that prism thing. I'll just um, you know, add it to the to the atmosphere of the studio. Love it. I hope, Love hope it. it's not distracting. I but it's either let it happen or I gotta get up and, and dismantle it. So no, no, don't do that. Yeah, yeah, leave it. No, it's great. Or just live in the rainbows. Yeah. Well it's it's like a like sometimes people can try to create that, you know, virtually, but you're yeah. like doing it like analog real life. It's not a filter. Yeah. No yeah. Filters, Snapchat so. filter or something. Yeah. Totally. Well, Vesper, I'm like, curious. You know, so you, Bambi you, ears or something. Oh, Sorry. yeah. I know the, the mouse nose whiskers. It's yeah. coming. Watch out.
no, no. Actually, I just recorded a, a video with Neil, uh, degraded dirt poor Robbins, and he had some type of thing set up on a Zoom. So you see like these thumbs up and I don't know, celebrations or something. It was just Great. like, what is that? And it's like totally apropos, you know, you know, dirt poor Robbins and Neil. Yeah, that feels about right. Yeah. yeah. So we'll <laughs> we'll see how it turns out in the final. Um, but uh, you know, I'm just wondering. So you, from an artist's point of view, you started as an illustrator from a young age. How was that transition getting into like the verbal arts and, you know, writing things out in stories and full books? Well, as I said, I mean, I, I was always writing. I just didn't realize it because I was a mm. huge journaler. And uh, oh. my one pain point, I would say, is that since beginning to be a novelist, I journal less now uh, because I'm so busy with writing the novels. And so um, I really miss the, the the depth of the journaling that I was doing for decades and um, I think that was all the preparatory ground for like my observations of the world and of human nature and of myself and of my relationships. Um, and so, yeah, journaling was a major part of it. And I just think uh, all artists should journal mm. for sure, whether you become a writer or not. It's just so important to internalize the way that you see the world and be able to give mm -hmm. language to that. What type of journaling uh, do you do? Like, how, how would you advise people to go about journaling to get the most out of it? I mean, for me, I guess it's just stream of consciousness, writing about my my day or about, um, mm -hmm. so, you know, a problem I've been wrestling with, or even if it's things like, I, I'm not, I'm not satisfied with my schedule, the way I'm scheduling my day as, mm. you know, because I'm a freelancer and so it's all on me. And so I'll even write through like, this is what I want my day to look like, I, you know, um, my mornings are too speedy and uh, okay, I'm going to get up at six 30. It's, it can be as mundane as that mm -hmm. all the way through, you know, working through like world events, mm. you know, and just kind of, um, just processing, just process. It's just processing or an interpersonal conflict or something that's made me happy or, mm. you know, what yeah. flowers I'm going to put in my garden this year, whatever it is, you know, yeah. it's, yeah. it's like a life lived on the page and speaking of analog, you know, this is something that I, I teach university and um, mm. I'm constantly trying to impress upon my students the, the, the nature of being an artist, being one in which like, we live through our five senses. Like we're extremely sensorily open, mm. right? And so as, especially in the illustration world, as things have become more digital, these digital tools wind up, you know, cutting us off from our body, our embodiment, you mm -hmm. know, as artists. And it becomes this kind of like narrow tunnel that we see things through as opposed to mm -hmm. when we can process things through our bodies, we, we get a full experience. And then that is what comes out you know, on the page or in the symphony or, you know, in the dance or whatever. Mm -hmm. it, the the importance of the body to the artist is huge. Uh, and so I think that the the act of writing something down like with your hand as opposed to typing it on a keyboard. Yes. It's part of that process and we can't short circuit it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that's uh, honestly, I mean, you know, so much has been said about social media and um, it's how it's killed us and everything. And, and a lot of that I think is because of that lack of a brain body connection it's mm. like we're living everything yes, yes. just like through not even the eyes because the eyes could take in everything around us but if it's just on this screen or on the ipad for an artist you know who's working in procreate or something mm. the world becomes so much more limited and detached from the body and and i really think that that is um leading to mm. really troubling um patterns with our interpersonal connections and how we even dehumanize each other, um, mm. you know, yeah, yeah. In, and why things seem so binary in terms mm. of our, oh, I'm, I'm on team A, team B. It's, yeah. because it's, it's not going to be going so anywhere good. disembodied, right? If it's yes. dehumanized, it's usually disembodied, yeah. you know, they're just an idea or an abstract rather than, you know, a person yeah. and uh, if you, you connect with. And you, you dis if you disembody yourself, 
how can you think that you're not going to disembody your neighbor? Yeah. Yeah. And, and justify, um, you know, their annihilation. Mm -hmm. Why would you not think that that is, you know, where this all goes? I mean, the, the Nazis knew this very well, mm -hmm. you know, by, um, by their portrayal of Jews as rats and things that are in subhumans, you know, mm -hmm. they just, that's not, that doesn't look like the neighbor that lives next door. Right. right. But by taking them out of their embodied human context, we, we can justify anything. Right. Mm -hmm. It's the vermin so. that we trap. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, I guess the practical advice would be what to uh, write your status updates on paper in a journal or something. <laughs> Maybe just turn off the damn thing. Yeah. <laughs> That's, you know, step one. Yeah. Step one, put it on, put do it not off. disturb. Like, you know, like uh, when I'm working, I, I, you know, I put my devices on do not disturb mm. and the only people who can reach me are my family. Mm. Yes. Well, who else would need to reach me during the day anyway, while I'm working. And, and plus it's going to, it's going to take me out of that creative space. I, I just don't need it. Mm. Um, yeah. And I try Shut to the take, door. What? I'm sorry. Shut the door. Yeah. You know, be in the space that you're in, and and I don't know. I could I could say a lot about that. I, I do talk a lot about that on my podcast about the embodiment. That's awesome, yeah. You know, I, and I I don't want to understate the importance of writing down the mundane things, mm -hmm. and it's so helpful for you to say that because I, I I target it down to two things. You know, one is like you said, creative output goes way up uh, for me in recent years, mm -hmm. but the second thing is I have a spouse, and so mm -hmm. a lot of um, what I used to journal as a, uh, a person who wasn't married, mm -hmm. now I can verbalize with my wife yeah. and we kind of like, you know, face to face back and forth. Yeah. Uh, so those are the two main things. But even now, if I, if I journal and it's, I mean, nothing to write a book about. I mean, I have uh, C.S. Lewis's letters and journals and it's great mm -hmm. to read. Yeah. Um, but I imagine that's like 10% of what he wrote down. A lot of it was just mundane stuff. Uh, because like even especially as, for me as an artist, like my mind, you know, like you're, you're trying to fight resistance and the evil ones come in to like mm -hmm. reprogram the narrative of how your day went. And so usually yeah. at the end of the day, and I'm just like beating myself up negative. And I just write down the, the facts of the day. I'm like, actually today wasn't that bad today. Today was all right. In fact, it was good. Today was yeah. good. And there really is something valuable in hearing something come out of your own mouth or come out of your own pen. Mm -hmm. Because often when I, when I come to the page angry and needing to process something, and then I write it down, I all of a sudden see it for what it really is. And I go, oh, in the words of the minor prophet, Taylor Swift, I'm the problem. It's me, you know? <laughs> um, so I, and, you know, just a, a little, uh, you know, other note of, of proof about this concept is that, um, Back in 2011, 2011 and 2012, I had a series of three car accidents back to back. Um, none of them were major high speed crashes or anything. It was all texters rear ending me. And after the uh. first two accidents, I um, started to notice I, I was having cognitive problems. You know, I just was, oh. I was forgetting stuff. It was really getting bad. And so I went to see a neuropsychologist and his prescription to me was, you have to make lists hmm. on paper with a pen. Hmm. And he said, no more putting lists in your phone. You actually have to, you know, keep a day planner. I want everything analog, you know? And it was remarkable how it cleared up my cognitive issues. And wow. I do find that the more I'm on a device, the more time that I'm on there, the more cognitive difficulty I have, you know, my brain gets foggy. Yes. I can't put my thoughts together. Mm -hmm forget about creativity. It's even just, you know, that mundane stuff. Mm -hmm. It is just so vital for us to like fight these days for any connection that we can get to the, the tangible real world and to people, mm -hmm. you know, there's, yes. it, it's like what we experienced during lockdowns with what I like to call jammy church, you know, like, Oh, we'll just go to church online. Yeah. It's like, well, that's not why you go to yeah. church. You go to church to be with people and participate yeah. together, you know, in, in this communal worship of God, like you're, you're deliberately taking yourself out of your normal life to be in, in the presence of other people oriented toward God and mm. putting all your attention there. Right. 
So if yeah. I'm, if my attention is divided and I'm sitting on my couch in my Snuggie, you know, like drinking my coffee and like folding my laundry. I mean, where is my attention going to go? Mm-hmm. And, and then I got this guy yapping at me on the screen, like trying to say something erudite. Yeah. How am I going to, yeah. what is that going to do for my spirit? Yeah. Going to fragment yeah. it. Totally. Especially you're in like the home is for me, it's so, so uh, representative of the practical space, right? It's down to earth in so many ways. And then you go, like, you almost have to leave that space to go into a place of high liturgy and, you know, you want to go to heavenly places, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that's, you know, one thing I love about the divine liturgy is it's, it's a full body experience. Like you mentioned it's five sentences. Yeah. That was um, very healing to us as a family was coming into the divine liturgy. Mm. Yeah. It felt very, very natural to us as artists. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it's almost like, healing in a way because i feel like artists in the west like we kind of still trying to find our place because on one side it's like one track is like postmodernism, uh and you're just like you know i don't know trying to make some type of like statement about a statement about a statement and then you're not sure where your foundation is yeah. and then over here it's like you're trying to make like i don't know uh church art or worship music and it's like the adjective christian in front of it and you're like you know for those that are you know in the faith but like it just feels like there's a pretty big chasm in between and in this modern western world we're trying to find a place and then you enter into this very ancient space and you're like oh my gosh like there isn't an inch of the wall that isn't covered with frescoes or arts or icons and everything's framed and it's like i'm sure lots of other artists feel like they're coming home i think so and I grew up in a family of artists and I went to an arts high school in New York. I was never not immersed in art in my life. Mm. And um, so I I became a Christian at 16 and it was in the context of being an artist. You know, I didn't have, I didn't grow up with any of the baggage of like that artists aren't as holy or something. I don't know, you know, these common um, struggles that people have, like, oh, I have to choose between my art and my faith. That was just never even present for me. It was like, oh, oh, uh, I'm an artist. Um, Oh, God made all of this. Oh, okay. Now I get it. You know? Yeah. And so I think that um, the problem in, let's say less traditional churches or, or churches that have practiced um, a certain degree of iconoclasm and don't have don't have those, you know, images or are are suspicious of those images. It's, it's such a divided message. It's like, um, you know, we would come to a church and and they would be so excited that we were artists because it would be like, Oh, and, and musicians like, Oh, can you play on the worship team? Oh, can you design our bulletin? Can you help us with our website? Can you like, or if they were even a little bit more enlightened, it would be like, can you do this installation? You know, Uh or like, and it was this very kind of applied approach, right? Uh-huh. Can we like slap this sticker on the sanctuary wall to, to say, oh, we're an art, we're supportive of the arts in this church, right? Mm-hmm. At the same time, artists are getting this, this other message, like, well, if you need beauty in your sanctuary, there must be something wrong with you. You're not as spiritual. Like you, you will be na- made not to care about beauty. You will be, mm-hmm. you know, you must be fine. You must be equally okay with worshiping in a vanilla box or in a movie theater, mm. you know? And so for, yes. for the artist, like there's going to come a point where you can no longer integrate those two chaotically disparate messages. Mm. And I think a lot of artists like that can be, I think we underestimate um that that can be a root of deconstruction ah uh, yeah. of the faith of, of of the entire faith yes you which know? you know goes in line with a pretty common trend where a lot of the people who are publicly uh making their you know deconstruction or leaving the faith um are typically artists they're the ones that are in the music music realm or some right. type of artistic fashion and they're the ones that are they're fallen man they're they're trying to find that foundation and it's just not there. Yeah. And they're wondering where to find the answers. And so they go drinking from broken cisterns, Mm. not realizing there's actually 2000 years of 
drinking water <laughs> like stored up for you yes um, you could partake of it it's fresh yeah. it's clear it's good it's you know it, it's life-giving and nourishing and um yes. it's not to say that it's perfect i you know the church certainly is not perfect but it has so much that we can avail ourselves of for for our spiritual health and and for resetting again you know to come back to the body like we are embodied incarnate creatures mm -hmm. walking around in a created world and think you know the church has a lot to say about that and a lot to offer us vesper have we arrived at at your talking point what's my talking point <laughs> oh <laughs> well um this is all going to be in there yeah okay I'm still, I'm still bringing it home here. Yeah. There's a lot I want to say, but uh, I'm going to be talking about historical cycles. Mm. Uh, you know, I, it's funny, you know, now that Jonathan has kind of popularized the, the thought of symbolic thinking, you know, mm -hmm. I thought that I was a symbolic thinker this whole time, you know, um, but I think that my expression of it, the way that I would word things would probably be different than his. And it, for a while, I felt kind of bad mm. about that. I was like, oh, I must just not have mm. been getting it this whole time. Um, but no, I think mm. uh, where I do uh, intersect there is in terms of patterns of history. So I'm okay. going to be talking about some patterns of history in the talk and also patterns of artistic thinking. Mm. You know, where where does artistic inspiration come from? And what do, what, what do artists tend to say about the times that they're living in, hmm. um, you know, in, in, at, at certain points of the historical um, cycle, you know, there's always an, an artistic movement hmm. that is responding to that. So are there yeah. going to be particular artists or writers that you're going to be focusing on? I think I'm particularly going to focus on uh, 20th century artists responding to World War II. Oh, that'll wow. be in there. But also um, I'm going to draw pretty heavily on Father Pavel Florensky um, and his concept of, you know, like where art comes from, hmm. you know, our, our relationship to the unseen realm. Okay. Tell me yeah. more about Florensky. Well, uh, a friend of mine gave me a copy of Iconostasis like I don't know, 20 years ago and I never read it because I was I, the, the title mm. kind of put me off. I was like, what is this? I, I don't know what an Iconostasis, what does that even mean? I didn't even yeah. know that it actually like is a physical thing, you know, <laughs> yeah. until a couple of years ago. Yeah. And I finally sat down with the book a number of years ago and it just, it was one of those books again, where um, I read the first section on dreams Oh. And how, when we dream, uh, our brain is responding to an external stimulus and then we dream backwards hmm. into that experience. So um, I thought that the book was a book about dreams. So I'm like, okay, well, okay. iconostasis, what does that have to do with dreams? All right, yeah. fine. And then I put it down for a number of years because that one that one section on the dreams was enough to give me, I actually wrote A Cloud of Outrageous Blue based on that chapter. Whoa. Yeah. Wow. It sparked- Without the, having read the entire, rest of the book? No. Wow. It was enough. Wow. Yeah. So um, it was only a couple of years ago that I sat down with the rest of the book and- oh, Truth be and told. <laughs> learned what, what else he had to say, you know, which was complete genius. And- um, it's one of those books like uh, Chaim Potok wrote a novel called My Name is Asher Lev. There are a few books like that that really get to like the, the nature of inspiration, the heart of the artist mm. and why we feel like we, when we're creating and when we're in that flow, like we, we can feel like we're touching something of the divine and mm. it's because we totally are. Mm. Um, so yeah. And I, I think that whether artists are conscious of that or not, that is our role, mm. you know, in the world. Yeah. It's a prophetic calling. Um, and just people with prophetic callings can go off the rails for sure. And wind up in, you know, if they're too open, 
they can find themselves in dangerous places. But uh, if we yeah. understand who it is that is speaking to us um, and asking us to respond to him, but also to the world that we exist in, um, we can kind of course correct, hmm. you know, and know what voices we're listening to. Yeah. Could you uh, just catch us up a little bit about the life of Florinsky? Oh, I don't know. I think you could do that better, right? Didn't you do a well? A I, I did a little bit. So I, I yeah, read. Ooh, let's see. I have it close by. I'll add what I can. I haven't okay. read um, his books in depth, but so uh, David Bentley Hart. He has this really interesting. It's not a history book. It's the story of Christianity, and so he kind of tells like parts of the chapters are like more of the standard stuff, and then he includes some of the weird stuff, some of the stuff on the margin. Yeah. Kind of like what Jonathan Peugeot is doing with his, you know, dog-headed saint um, mm -hmm. projects. And every artist is a dog-headed saint. Okay. Yeah. Let's, oh. just, let's just go there. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, could you explain why, why, why is an artist a dog-headed saint? Well, will get back because to what I'm we, saying. It's because we, we are, we, we live on the margins. That's just, that's what the artist mm -hmm. is. You know, we translate. We're, we're like the, you know, artists are like the universal translator on mm. Star Trek, you mm. know, and um, we're, we're, we're getting messages from both sides of things. You know, we live in this kind of like, and, and Florensky talks about this, that uh, living on that liminal, in that liminal space between the seen and the unseen. Mm. And so, yes. you know, we're artists temperamentally, you know, are very open people we're we're open to stimulus physical stimulus but also spiritual stimulus mm -hmm. and so um it, that by nature means that we are um we're on we're marginal mm -hmm. you know that, like that's the what gatekeepers like, yeah and and if if we live in the expression of that in a sanctified way it's it's life it's mm -hmm. life giving yeah you know we can become way makers for people mm. you know we can we can be the self the sense making apparatus mm -hmm. for people who are confused and you know um because we can allow god's work to to pass through us and pass through our work you know to other people to make sense um but it also means that uh sometimes we get attracted to the monstrous uh. you know You've seen that. You've seen artists yeah. destroy themselves mm -hmm. um, because they don't know how to. You know, they don't. Ha they don't know how to navigate that liminal space themselves. And and unfortunately, as more and more artists leave the church, th the church loses out because it doesn't know how to steward, you know, that gift. So that's what I mean by yes. you know we're all the dog-headed saints living out here on the on the edge. I've heard it described that artists are like cartographers or people that make maps of uncharted territory. Yeah. Uh, because if you don't have that, then you're not going to know how to navigate new things or new areas. Yeah. Um, something about, well, Florensky, yeah. he was born in an interesting time. I, well, I'm just speaking totally, you know, subjectively here. The thing that really intrigues me about his life is that he was born around the time where Dostoevsky was finishing the, the Brothers Karamazov. And then he lived through the First Great World War. And then he was killed uh, in a gulag before the start of the Second Great World War, I think in 1937. Yeah. Uh, what fascinates me about him is he reminds me of so many other people in the symbolic world. So he was... Uh, his mother and his father was like was the right and the left brain essentially so like he had a very artistic parent and a very logical parent and he was like the coming together of both of his parents and so he had a part of him that was just like next level artist and then he had a next level like he was a lead engineer for the electrification of russia so like yeah, yeah. Uh, but then he was also very aesthetic and he wore a, a cassock it was actually one of the reasons i'm sure it if you raided uh, the regime at the time and they sent him to the the gulag. Uh, but then it, it just reminds me of things like JP Marceau and the work that he's doing with metaphysics mm -hmm. and the empirical side of things and more of like the, the forms and the kind of like the mathematical part of patterns and what we're, right. what we're learning here and helping people address the meaning crisis from that side. 
But then you have other people like, of course, Jonathan Peugeot, who's much more of like the intuitive artist and kind of like the mysterious part of, you know, charting the unknown territory. And so I feel like he was like the symbol of these two halves of our being. And he just, you look at some of the things he did and it was very technical and the other things it was very mystical, which yeah. is really fascinating. Yeah, I, I think people, uh, when they think about artists, they think, oh, we're just all flaky and un disorganized and um, living in the ether and all of that. And mm -hmm. no, there, there are many, many different kinds of artists, you know, some who are quite analytical. I mean, a lot of the work that I do as a historical researcher is like very didactic and very, uh, you know, outline precept upon precept, you know, um, the, the way that I put these things together is not just like, oh, I received this message from God, you know? Right. Uh, yes. Right. And, and I think that's also why I illustrate my books um, mm. it, with Berliners. There was a, a question about, um, cause it, it was, you know, being positioned as um, more of a mainstream book. And the question was, well, are the illustrations distorted? you know, detracting from its, um, commercial appeal. Mm -hmm. And I just, there was a discussion, you know, should, should it not be illustrated? And I, I said, absolutely not. I can't, mm -hmm. I can't, I'll, I'll die if I don't make paintings, you yeah. know, <laughs> like, um, you know, who you're so, talking to <laughs> like, I'm an illustrator first. That's how I process the yeah. world is through pictures. Yeah. Um, and so the, it really, they are two halves of my brain as well. You know, ah, I could definitely okay. recognize, uh, a little of the Florensky in, in my process because mm. some things need to be written out in words and some things cannot, they need to be pictures. They need to be impressions mm. and they need to be, you know, that mechanism that slows the reader down and, and makes you, you know, you, you're reading, you're reading, you're reading. And then all of a sudden you open to a picture and mm. it speaks to you on a, a whole different level. Yeah. You know, bypasses the the cognitive and goes right to the heart. Mm, yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. It's a lot like language of creation mm -hmm. where, you know, there's text, but the text is very condensed. And yeah. for the most part, it's images and, and maps. They're like little maps. Yeah. And there's times, <laughs> there's times where you read a paragraph, right? Like a topic sentence of like, this is my, my statement of, yeah. you know, what I'm claiming and the evidence is an illustration. Yeah. <laughs> There's yeah. no words. It's just like, and okay, move on to the next chapter. That should be, you know, you know, evidence for my point enough. And then, you know, the impression when I read the language of creation, the, the impression that it leaves with me is such an emotional reaction. Mm. You know, it, it's such a logically written book, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's right. It's very lean. There's no extra. Mm. Um, it, it's, it's something I aspire to in my writing is to be as lean as I can. Mm -hmm. I don't want anything extraneous or flowery. Um, I love language. I love the, the way language sounds. So there's that, but, um, I, I don't want it to be dry, mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, like economy with your words helps get the point across. Right. So the language of creation, yeah, very lean, but then, yeah, like the picture kind of, um, it's more than an infographic, uh -huh. you know, they're more than infographics. They, they give your, I don't know, they give you your more intuitive brain something to process mm -hmm. afterward. Yeah. You know? Well, plus it's, it's like a window, you know, I look at my window and it's, it's like you, you instantly are impressed with information. Right. So it, it's almost like before your logical brain can initiate this step-by-step -step sequence of reason, it's like the information impresses a part of you. That's more of like the spiritual sense, like say the noose. Um, and it's like you, it's almost like rep, the, the process of connecting with information at like a revelation. It's a process of revelation rather yeah. than this logical step-by-step -step sequence where you it's a journey where you finally arrive at this, you know, thing that makes sense to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. And, and people's concept of revelation is, 
<laughs> it's very mixed these days, isn't it? You know, people are very yeah. suspicious of revelation as they mm -hmm. should be, you know, they should be suspicious of it, but maybe it's because they don't have enough artists that are helping them make sense of what they're being impacted with. Well, I agree with you. I yeah. agree with you. Because <laughs> um, like, it's, it's almost like good art is like you're building a language for how to receive that properly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's really well said. Um, and I think uh, until fairly recently, until, you know, the, the modern world, we had those containers for, res for revelation. I think one one of the things that surprised me when I became Orthodox was um, uh, there there are so many uh, rules. Uh, you know, I don't like to use that word, but traditions, rituals, expectations. You know, things to do. There's a lot of things to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I even heard, um, you know, some Orthodox thinkers uh, who are like very suspicious of the imagination and say, "Don't trust your imagination" and things. And I thought, well, my God, how am I going to make it? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. how am I going to make it through if that's the case? And then just come to discover that that's only one stream of thought within orthodoxy. But um, then come to find that, oh, no, then there's like myrrh streaming icons and like miraculous healings. And there's, yes. you know, all of this mysticism and the hesychastic uh you know like all of this stuff right mm -hmm. but it's within the container of the tradition mm -hmm. and so i was just talking with a priest this morning about um when my grandmother passed away a couple of years ago uh i i found i it was very very difficult for me to grieve and a couple of years you know into this i'm like i i don't feel this like depth of emotion that I did, for example, when my grandfather died 20 years ago hmm. and it really wrecked me. Like I, I felt so horrible and guilty. And then I, I came to realize, no, it's actually that for the first time, my, my grief took place within a container that ha that gave me language um, to be able to, you know, sing memory eternal for her to be able to commemorate the anniversary of her death a year later and know that, you know, her, her memory is being kept alive, mm. you yes. know, within the life of the church was, I, I think that is what made it. I don't want to say easier, but like it was a softer landing mm. maybe. Yeah. yeah. You know, and grief is one of those emotions that, that actually is, I think of the same, it's cut from the same cloth as revelation hmm. in a way. So... It, it takes you to a, it takes you to a new level of understanding of your life and what it's for and of hmm. mortality. And um, I think October 7th did that for me too. Yeah. I'm a different person since October 7th. Hmm. Um, How's that? Um, it, there, there's a, um, let's, how do I put this? You know, if there's a silver cord that connects you to the world, right? Mm -hmm. Let's just say that within that silver cord, there's many, many strands. Okay. And as you experience, uh, revelation of glory, you know, where this whole thing is going, it kind of snips one of those strands. You 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 lose a little bit of your tight hold onto the world, and it, it allows you to to release and say, "Oh no, that that that's where this is going, right?" But I think grief does that too. And um, after October seventh, I experienced it, like many, many, many of my connections to the world severed. Hmm. Mm hmm. Um, and I, it's, I'm, I'm grateful for the church. I'm grateful for my, my priest confessor, um, having given me a bit of a softer landing, um, because I was in despair mm. yeah. after that, you know, the work that I do with these novels means that I go into very, very difficult parts of history that are very wounding. You mm -hmm. don't write a book about the Holocaust and not 
lose a part of yourself. You, part, part of me died with that first book mm. and with Berliners. They feel like part of the same process to me. Yeah, like the, the sort of revelation, creative process, understanding the world better as I get older mm -hmm. and then realizing, wow, I just really, I can't, I can't, there are things I thought I could trust in this world, like friendships that I've lost since October 7th. Um, oh. People who show me who they really are, um, who show that they have no problem mm. standing for evil things. Uh, yeah. And you gotta let you that go. Like, um, <laughs> like when you, like a apocalyptic way where you remove the veil and you kind of see what's behind there, like that type of understanding. Yeah. And so it's almost like, is it like grief is something that if you get through it, if you, you know, uh, navigate through it through like what you're talking about through confession and, mm -hmm. and you go through these protocols, you could say yeah. uh, on the other side of that is understanding or something new. <laughs> Yeah. Is it something like well, that? It's it's exactly like that. And you you come to understand what what is eternal and what's going to make it through um mm. the testing, the flames of testing. Yeah. And it's not the things that you thought. M maybe you thought, oh, my relationships will make it through. Mm. Oh, the truth will make it through. Oh, the facts will make it through the flames. Oh, the logic will make it through the flame. No, it won't. No, um, the, the only thing that remains for me um, is, is the wound in Christ's side. Mm. That's, it. That's it for me. Um, that, that's, I, I can say over the last you know 10 years since I've been writing these novels, that is just impressed upon, impressed upon me constantly. Mm. That's, that's the, you know, and the resurrection. I mean, of course, you know, let me not stop with the crucifixion, but um, the, the crucifixion is that veil, you know, that we have to go through to, to reach the resurrection. Uh, no. Right. So the, the sacrifice, you know, the, the tough part pressing in through that to get to the other side. Yeah, it's not just tough, it's devastation. Mm. Yeah. It's devastation. Okay, so uh, last year, my my son entered the Marines. Oh. He's training special forces in the Marines, and um, at the same time, I also have friends in Israel who's uh, who have sons fighting in the IDF who are in Gaza. My son um, is not on active duty yet; he's still in training. But our sons went into the military at the same time, and okay. so I have these friends who I've been walking with as mothers facing the very real possibility that the worst could happen, you know, mm. and you have to face that. You have to face that. If you, if you wear rose colored glasses about it, you, you know that if you wear rose colored glasses about it, you won't make it through if that worst thing happens. Right. So you, there, you have to build a little room for yourself in which that possibility exists. Hmm. And in which the possibility of you not dying from that exists, right? Mm. Yeah. Um, and so it's just, it's another snip of, of the cord, you know? So it's within that context, right? That, um, that as an artist, I'm making work. And it can feel at times like, well, why am I, <laughs> why does it make sense for me to take this beautiful color lavender pencil and make a mark on a page? Like, what's the point of that mm. in light of our mortality and children dying and, and mm. all of that? Um, and yet there really, there's just nothing else you can do. You must make the work yeah because it's your map you yeah. know right reminds me of uh i'm making my way slowly through uh timothy petit says the the ethics of beauty yeah I, have you read through that one too 
No, no I had dinner with Timothy uh, a while oh, back. Um, great. great guy, but I have not read his work. It's, like, okay. it's, it's on the stack. <laughs> well, yeah, and it's probably a little bit thicker than the Karamazov. Yes, so. <laughs> yes. Uh, but uh, the parts that I've gone through, I found really interesting. He's starts out this book of beauty with uh, PTSD and trauma. And mm -hmm. one of the things is that that historically, and he uses uh, the Greek culture and the Iliad as an example, right. of how that was written for soldiers and veterans coming yeah. from battle. And so they, they use this story and this play to help people heal from that trauma together yes. yeah. as brothers. And so they, it was not an entertainment thing. It was really, it was like a prescription yeah. for people to heal through that time. And they used narrative to do that. Mm -hmm. And and think about it, how much closer people were to death at that, at, at the time when any of our greatest works have been written. Mm. Let's take the brothers, for example, right? We live in an unbelievably sanitized world. We're so, I mean, talk about just being disconnected from the body. We are so disconnected from the reality of death mm. that we, we, there is a part of us that thinks that we are going to live forever. Mm. It's insane. Yeah. You know, and, and a lot of our problems come from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're kind of off yeah. the charts right now. Completely. Probably, probably due for a wake up call, unfortunately. Well, you said it. Yeah. Um, but those works of art have helped countless generations to make sense of things. And, and not just, you know, uh, the, the sorrow of it and all of that. Right. But like the beauty, I mean, um, I, I sing in the choir and directly across from me, you know, across the nave is our Golgotha. And so I sing the whole liturgy, like st staring at the cross um, and like everything that I'm singing is like in light of the cross. It is the most beautiful icon of the crucifixion I've ever laid eyes on and it happens to be in my church. Um, awesome. It's sublime. It's sublime. And it's so beautiful. Like, but it's also the worst thing. So, no. But then there's also, you know, the the sheer beauty of things that that are not connected to death, right? There's, there's like icons of, um, I mean, just the physical beauty of the icons, like just the gold and the the lights and the um and the incense and and this this the music and all of it is so heartbreakingly beautiful. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a joy, right? Yeah. Um, so all of these things, you know, help us to, I think, see the world as it really is, not just not just the reality we see in front of us or around us, but like the things that we're not seeing, the unseen realm. Mm -hmm. If you were to give yourself advice, your 20 year old self advice, what would you tell yourself? The aspiring illustrator, writer? I would definitely say have more kids. Have more kids? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yep. why because i have two and i would have loved to have five okay um they uh have been unbelievably i mean they're not just precious people and they're my own children right but they've been so important to me as an artist like watching watching people become you know watching a human become mm. There's nothing like that in the world. And, yeah. and, you know, it demands a lot of you, but boy, boy, it's worth it. Um, worth so it. that I would have said that. I would have said, don't try so hard to break in to the industry mm. and just um, make work that's meaningful to you. Mm -hmm. And I did. I did. I just think I, I would have, I would have done more and I would have been a little bit more adventurous. Okay. Making. Yeah. And did you, so, so do you work with a publisher or are you self-published? I work with traditional publishers. Yeah. So I, um, I'm published with Penguin Random House, 
Um, my novels are with Knopf and, um, but I also illustrate picture books for other publishers like uh, Little Brown and Harper and, you know, those publishers. Okay. And then you also uh, do illustrations like for Nicholas Kotar. That was an exception because <laughs> it oh. was a big exception. Okay. And it was kind of like when he contacted me to do that, yeah, I mean, we're, we're friends. Um, but he was like, uh, what would you say about doing this, you know, like by Thanksgiving? I'm like, you're insane. Oh, that's right. Yes. You're totally insane. Yeah. Um, but I found a little window of time and I was like, all right, let's go for it. Let's try, you know, and it, um, it kind of became a way for me to to try some personal stuff that I've been wanting to do um, and uh, just kind of break out of the box a little bit. OK, some of some other work I was doing. So that was really, really fun. Like some of my favorite pieces that I've done in a, in a few years have are actually in that book. Okay. So like all of the illustrations, like in the pages right here, yeah. like that one right there was like a total breakthrough piece for me. The, the, um, I, what do you call her? Is she a goddess? I don't know. Like this, the spirit of the yeah, spirit of the wood, of the wood <laughs> walking with the wolves. Yeah. That piece to me is like, that's like a little glimpse into my heart right there. That feels like me on the page, yeah. you know, there's yeah. certain works that, you know, as an artist, when you, it, it almost never happens. Okay. It's like 0.1% of the time that what you have in your mind actually makes it onto the page in its full form. That piece is one of those. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, satisfying. it's beautiful. And so are you looking forward to having more opportunities to have like the kind of like the side experimental projects? Yeah, I think um, it's hard. You know, I, I'm, I'm always working on a lot of books at once and um, making the space for that. Like I, I've been working on something with Martin Shaw um, ah. and, we've been, and it's like, oh, trying to squeeze water from a stone um, in terms of what? time. <laughs> it's crazy. I'm like, Oh man, I hope we can do this in the next 10 years. I don't, oh I don't know. Now, is that on you or is it. that on him or just the process? It's just the process. And we're both very busy, you know, um, so finding the time. And um, so I'm looking forward to seeing him at the conference and just talking through it a little bit more. Yeah. Oh, I had a question about that. So you guys are going to be talking on day three. Oh, good. Good news. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to get there, down there and let them tell me wh where to go. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, sometimes it's better that way. It's just really, yeah. uh, let's see. And I, man, I feel so great because I don't have to do any speaking or hosting or anything. I just get to enjoy. So that's awesome. Yay me. Uh, let me share. So here's the yeah. website and they posted the schedule. Oh, great. I haven't seen this yet. Yeah. Well, we can go through it together. Okay, good. This is, this is news to me. Yeah. So day one, Thursday, leap year, of mm -hmm. course. Uh, so they have John Hears, MC. That's going to be great. I feel like there's something symbolic in the fact that we're starting on the leap year. I, yeah. I, I think there's we'll let John intention is. behind that one. Tell for us sure. what it is. <laughs> our dog hearted, our dog headed artist, for sure. <laughs> leap year. Dog headed year. Yeah. <laughs> Not going to be able to do this for another four years. So here That's we right. go. So yeah, uh, cool one. Yeah, Dirk Robin's going to be performing, which is going to be awesome music. And then day two, Friday, lots of panels going on. Okay, so yeah, I see Martin Shaw's wrapping up in the afternoon. And so you're day three, Nicholas in the morning, and twice. And then here you are. So you're... This is what I was wondering. It's like you have group two, part one, and mm -hmm. there's your talk. And then part two is Martin Shaw. Is mm -hmm. that like two halves of the same coin? Or is it like you do your thing know. and he does it? Or is it like just one talk? You kind of like bouncing off each other? I don't, well, gosh. I mean, I'm glad he's following me because I wouldn't be able to follow him. He's amazing. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm very glad to see this because it means that I get to get through my, my thing and then just like sit at Martin's feet for the rest. Of the afternoon. Yeah, it's good. Um, and then uh, it looks like we're going to be on a panel together in the later afternoon. So that's really great. Yeah. So you're going to, you know, morning, afternoon. So the last day will be a busy day for you. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what it is, but I feel like every time I look at this, like the 
titles of the talks keep getting longer. Like you're kind of going against the grain, just having four words here. <laughs> that that sounds about right with this crew. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All That's right, great. Fun. It's cool. So yeah, uh, we're at the time of recording, we're only a couple of weeks away from this. Less than yeah. that, 10 days. It's like so it's excited. Coming right up. Yeah. So it's gonna be oh, it's gonna be great. This yeah. feels like something whose time has definitely come. Like I'm really excited to, um, you know, meet people in the community and everything, and yeah, hopefully have something to offer. Uh, what's the best way to, for people to reach your work, connect with you? Well, you can find my books anywhere, um, Amazon or you know the the usual suspects. Or I I always tell people try your independent bookstore first, and you know get the book okay. through them. You can always order it if they don't have it. Um, but if you want to connect with me online, I'm mainly on Instagram at Vesper Illustration. And then my website is VesperIllustration.com. And you can sign up for my newsletter there. Okay. And do you write a, a an announcement newsletter or is it a frequent one? It's not frequent. It's really when I have, mainly when I have events or books launching. Um, I have a book launching next week, uh, a picture book. What? Yeah. What's, what's um, going on? So it's, uh, it's this one right here. It's called oh. Amazing Abe. Um, and it's about Abraham Kahane, who, um, not Kahane, Kahan, uh, who was the founder of the Jewish Daily Forward, which was the biggest Yiddish daily newspaper um, at the turn of the century. Mm. And it's an interesting story. And I got to illustrate turn of the century New York. And it was really, really fun really a blast. And unfortunately, um, my author passed away a couple of weeks ago, right before the release of this book. So I feel like, uh, this responsibility has been handed to me to, um, to serve this book. So, oh yeah. So yeah. it's like in memory. Yeah, exactly. Oh, man. Um, and it, that's for elementary school. Okay. My, the other books that I write are young adult and they're really mainly adult, but if okay. you have young adults in your life who you want to, to give some uh, grounded literature, let's say, that's not going to, you know, ruin your children. <laughs> mm. Would you <laughs> say, like, for example, would uh, Berliners be good to give to, to like a 16 year old, someone in high school? Oh, yeah, I would say my novels are good for about 14 and up. I, I say freshman and up. Okay. Yeah. I say, I don't, I don't know. I read Berliners and man, I was, I was crying. It almost was a similar response to I, this is an extreme example, but like rep, Requiem for a Dream, where you see like a few choices here and there lead to, um, you know, trafficking or something, you know, very dire, serious and dangerous um, that have, you know, implications for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was, and that's the thing that you're able to accomplish in a page. I was just like, oh man, this girl can write. She can write. Gosh, thank you. Yeah, but I have uh my so I I come from a family where it's just me and my sister, so a small sister uh, a small family. Yeah. But then my wife, they have seven kids or seven brothers and sisters, and so big family, yeah. and I just love marrying into a big family. That's awesome. So the the nieces that I married into, I got to become their uncle, which is great. Uh, so like they're readers and they're mm -hmm. in late high school, young adults. Perfect. So like for example, for Christmas, I gave them an extra copy of C.S. Lewis uh, Screw Tape Letters. Nice. They were like so excited. It was yeah. just like, so uh, uh, I'm always on the lookout for good books for, for my nieces. And I well, think uh, Berliners is definitely one of them. Perfect age yeah. for what I write. So yeah. And I, I would say probably, um, yeah, the majority of my readership are adults, even though this is in the young adult genre. It's, I don't really, I, I definitely don't write down, you know? <laughs> um mm -hmm. Yeah, I really appreciate the work you're doing too, because there was a stint, you know, it. I, I was a substitute teacher in mm -hmm. 2021. God bless you. <laughs> and it was an experience. It was like, sure. and I was in California, right? So yeah, height of the lockdown era, plexiglass right. everywhere. Yeah. I was uh, substituting virtually, but I, I had to show up to campus and host it in person in a classroom by myself, this giant room with like, you know, 30 empty chairs yeah, and host it. And, you know, most of their cameras were off and it was just, everybody's wearing masks just for, it, it was just the crazy of the crazy time. And for yeah. that little period, I was a substitute teacher, but I learned 
so much about that time. And one yeah. of the things I learned is I would go into the library and hang out with some of the other faculty and the few students that could be on campus. And just, I would just look at the, what, what are they reading? Kind of like a window into, uh, I'm, I'm old enough to start feeling out of touch. And I'm yeah. like, well, <laughs> my daughter's six. And so it's mm -hmm. like, thank God I have these nieces now. I can you yeah. know, <laughs> actually know what's happening in the world because yeah. things are changing so much. And so yeah. I got like this sample of what are they reading? You know, what's in front of them? Mm -hmm. And some of it was just, gut-wrenching and appalling I just could not yeah. believe it like either I was disgusted like uh C.S. Lewis in gosh what was it uh Narnia when the professor's mm -hmm. like ah what are they teaching the kids these <laughs> days like I had that response kind of the old man professor response <laughs> yeah but then I also had this like like ethical response of just like these principles are yeah. bad patterns man this is not connecting people this is not connecting heaven and earth at all and so right again, right yeah. And it's, I think it's less about, um, you know, I'm just coming to understand that story is everything. And there's a lot of writing taking place that is um, beginning from a place of activism or morality. And most of the time the writing suffers. And, you know, mm. I have an 18 year old daughter oh. and she and her friends, and they're very widely read. They're not, you know, prudish or anything like that but um they often talk about just how how poor the writing is right now um so mm -hmm. you know I, I i i lay this as a as a challenge to my fellow authors uh, who are amazing i i work with unbelievably amazing people in my writing community um let's just keep making good stories because yes man, yes you know let's put the story first and everything yes. else will fall into place if we just do that yeah i went to uh walmart a couple months ago and you know of course Wal walmart's an interesting sample too because you get like the best of the best and so you get like this this you know not just like the top books but like the top of the top books because yeah they, they only have like four shelves to put them on. Right. So they, of all the genres mm -hmm. and some of the ones I saw in there was just like, oh man, we have work to do. We, yeah. we have work to do because it's yeah. like all that to say, I, I'm just really excited that you're doing the work that you're doing Vesper and that you're writing books for people that are coming of age and forming who they are, their purpose, their identity, and to do it in a way that can, fill them full of that purpose or help them see that. But then, you know, also gosh, help them through healing, mm -hmm. help them uh, become whole at a really critical age in their life. Yeah. God willing. God willing. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much for your time today, Vesper. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Derek. It's been a pleasure.